Greetings in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we are beginning a new uh, experience for the life of First Church at a time of uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, we are meeting individually, separately in our homes to worship the Lord together virtually. So this will be the first of our virtual worship services. Uh, what I will do is have something of an abbreviated service for you today, maybe a little bit more extended in the weeks to come. But we will see how that works out. So uh, if you'll follow along with me, uh, we'll have our regular, a little bit of the regular order of service. Uh, and uh, so let's hear God's call to worship this today uh, from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He, he determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you for this moment in history and time where we are set about in a new circumstance. We pray that your spirit would bless us and provide for us in our separate places. We pray, Lord, that you strengthen us as we look to our Lord Jesus Christ and know that in Him we have all that we need to face every circumstance in life. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For a moment now we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe it's in your hymnal at the back of your hymnal. If you have a copy of that with you. We'll look at the Apostles' Creed. It's on the back of your hymnal, page number 845 of the uh, Red Trinity Hymnal. Let's confess our faith together in the form of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You know, we go through that creed from Sunday to Sunday, and we confess it by faith. It's very much an historical creed in terms of reciting the history of our Savior and His mediatorial work for us at the cross. It's a Trinitarian creed, beginning with our faith in God as our Maker and Creator, and then not only speak about Jesus, but also about the Holy Spirit and His work within the life of the church. There are a couple of phrases that uh, might be unfamiliar to you or phrases that you uh, perhaps not quite understood. For example, what does it mean when it says that Jesus descended into hell? It might be thought among some that the descent of Jesus into hell took place after he died on the cross, and then for the three days in which he was buried and in the tomb, his soul went into hell for that period of time and suffered for God's people, or went into hell and there proclaimed the gospel to those who were yet in hell and led many of them out of hell into heaven. That's the viewpoint that many will have today, but I think uh, our understanding of that is more accurate and precise if we consider the fact that Jesus, when he died on the cross, when he suffered and died, when the earth was covered with darkness for three hours, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he committed his spirit to the Lord and 
breathed his last. Uh, those moments there on the cross were when he entered into hell for us. There is when he suffered for our sin. There the wrath of God was revealed on him when God, as it were, turned his back to his very own son. That was hell. And that's where he descended into hell, at the cross, where he suffered for our sins. Uh, when he passed on that cross, his soul did not go into Hades, into Sheol, into the realm of the dead, into hell, however you describe it. But he went immediately into the presence of his Father in glory. After all, you recall that what he said to the thief on the cross beside him was, Today, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. Well, how could he be in paradise that very day if Jesus first had to go to hell, or the realm of the dead, however you describe it again? How can it be that Jesus would go to the realm of the dead, and yet also say to the thief on the cross, This day you will be with me in paradise? Clearly, Jesus immediately went into the presence of his Father, along with the thief on the cross, to join with all the saints in glory for a brief moment. Jesus would return back into this world, and uh, his dead body would be raised and reunited with his glorious soul, body being transformed, and then he would go from the tomb to appear before the disciples alive. You might note then that uh, it is very difficult to have an idea of purgatory uh, when it comes to considering the, excuse me, the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross surely had no time to purge his life of his sins. Surely had no time to work out righteousness in such a way that he would merit favor with God. He did not have time to appeal to the merits of the saints because they had not existed yet, at least in terms of the New Testament church. Nor did Mary herself ascend into heaven and uh, become able to render aid to the thief on the cross. Yet nonetheless, the promise of Jesus was, Today, you will be with me in paradise. We see then that the work of Christ is sufficient to cleanse us from all of our sins, to cover us with his own perfect righteousness, and to bring us fully justified into the presence of God forever and ever. There is no place then for this idea of the soul going into the realm of the dead and uh, descending there for a period of time, or going to purgatory and to work out your uh, sufferings and, and uh, be purged of your evils in order to be prepared for an entrance into glory. There is no time uh, period here for that. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And this to a man who was just saved that very afternoon, that very moment in time. So there's no place for a purgatory in Scripture, no place for an understanding of that in terms of the saints, and no place for the idea of soul sleep or a realm of the dead to which Jesus must appear after his death and bring them up to glory or anything like that. The soul, when it passes from this life, immediately goes into the presence of the Lord. And so that's excuse me, one part of the confession, of the creed, that you might uh, wonder about. Another one is one that uh, uh, someone very close to me asked me about uh, recently. What do we mean by speaking about the Holy Catholic Church? And we, being Protestants, we who have uh, left the Roman Catholic Church uh, might have some difficulty with identifying ourselves with the Holy Catholic Church. Well, the word Catholic is not uh, exclusive to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the word Catholic means universal. And it speaks of the whole Church of Lord Jesus Christ uh, in, in whatever community it reveals itself or manifests itself in. So the Catholic Church is the gathering of all of God's people in Berkeley, in Philadelphia, in Dallas, Texas, in Istanbul, in uh, Tokyo, Japan, wherever God's people gather together, they are members of the Catholic Church, the universal church. What is more, we are joined to the church above in glory as well, 
as the people of God gathered there in heaven. We are members of this great Catholic Church. You might recall that the history of the church is that there was the great church from the time of Christ and the apostles, and that continued for a period of time until about the year 1054, when the Eastern Church broke off from the Western Church. The Eastern Church became the Eastern Orthodox Church, and that includes the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox Churches, and others as well, the Assyrian Orthodox Church. And then you had the, the Western Church, which became the Roman Catholic Church up until the Protestant Reformation, in, uh, fifth, you know, typically viewed as starting in 1517 when Martin Luther posted his 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg Castle. It's at that point in time that the Protestant Church uh, forms and, and reveals itself. And so from about 1054 on, you have the Roman Catholic Church, but that was descriptive of just that, that church. And over time, the Protestant Church left the Roman Catholic Church, so the Catholic Church was not always known as the Catholic Church. It was just once the Christian Church. And uh, we were all part of that one church long ago. And so uh, do not be troubled by a description of the church as a Catholic Church. Uh, that is not descriptive of the Roman Catholic Church per se, but it's descriptive of the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whatever denomination, of whatever uh, region that is located in. All those who savingly and truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are members of that Catholic Church. It doesn't mean that everyone who makes a profession of faith or everyone who calls themselves Christians or a, are a part of a Christian church are truly members of this Catholic Church. It is only those who are among God's elect. Well, we'll finish with that here. And let's take a moment to pray uh, for the needs of our church and our community at this time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're the sovereign Lord of history and time, and you govern the affairs of men according to your will and purpose. And you are pleased at times to bring hardship and trouble into the world, in order that we might be humbled, that we might be uh, confronted with our own mortality, and come face to face with the glory of God. We do pray, O oh Lord, that in these difficult times where uh, a pandemic has spread across the earth and many people are frightened and uh, 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 shut in at home uh, and many others uh, are at least concerned for their health. We do pray that your spirit would uh, bless your church at this time. May this time of uh, enforced isolation be an opportunity for your church to expand and grow exponentially. We pray, Lord, that you would bless your church and its witness in these difficult times. Help us to show forth the Lord Jesus Christ, who triumphed over all, over sin and death, and gives us everlasting life by the sacrifice of himself on the cross. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us in faith, quicken us in hope, and deliver us from all evil. We then pray for the members of First Church and its friends and adherents, uh, those who have visited, we pray, Lord, that you would watch over us, provide for our earthly needs, protect us from this uh, coronavirus, and protect us as well from other forms of harm and evil. We pray for your blessing on our elderly, that you would sustain them in life, strengthen those who are young and healthy. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, provide for them, as especially they may be under stress at this time without work uh, for some time it would appear. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for our earthly needs. We pray for our president, Mr. Trump, for the vice president, Mr. Mike, Mike Pence. We thank you for them and their leadership in preparing our country for these things and strengthen us for them. We pray that you would guide them and the medical community that they are working with. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us uh, wisdom and guidance uh, as to how we may best live for you. We pray for your blessing on our church, cause it to prosper and grow. And all things you would teach us, we would ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, 
Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For our meditation today, I want to read to you from Psalm 91. I'll give some comments on the psalm. I won't say that I have uh, an exhaustive review of the psalm for you today, but at least I hope it will be helpful and encouraging to you. It's a psalm that uh, a number of people are quoting at this time with the uh, pandemic at work in our uh, world. And so it would be helpful for us to see it, hopefully, uh, in its uh, historical context and its biblical context and interpret it accordingly. You'll note that it comes in the fourth book of the book of Psalms that begins in uh, Psalm 90. Uh, there are five books in the book of Psalms, five different collections of Psalms within the broader category of the Psalms. Uh, you'll notice that the 90th Psalm begins with a reference to Moses. It is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. The 91st Psalm following it does not have an inscription as to who the author is, does not tell us any of the circumstances behind the Psalm. So we really have uh, very little to Nothing to go on in terms of who the author is. I've seen arguments uh, back and forth from uh, the author being Moses that uh, I might be more inclined to feel that is the author of the psalm. Then you have those who say, well, it's David in his flight from Absalom uh, towards the end of his life. Or others say that it is a psalm that was composed in the post exilic period, perhaps in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, no particular individual uh, uh, commented on there, but uh, you can see that the whole breadth of Old Testament history comes into view there in these different uh, descriptions of who might be the author of the psalm. The general nature of the psalm, however, while providing a, a, a challenge to interpreters and a test for us to understand it, nonetheless, uh, as to its beauty and charm in view of the fact that it therefore applies generally to the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It addresses us in all of our circumstances in life, and I hope that we'll get to see a little bit of that as we make our way through the psalm. I'll read the psalm for you, and then uh, make some comments uh, for you on the psalm. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. 
I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we take a moment to look to this psalm, we pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts. We pray that you would encourage us to rest in the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would advance your work in our homes and our families and in our community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I saw a picture in the news of uh, highway uh, out, I believe, in California that was empty, no cars on it. And if you've ever been to California, you know that that's a very, very strange experience. I remember years ago, I went out to California to study at Westminster Seminary in California, and I took the opportunity to um, drive up uh, towards uh, Los Angeles and uh, Hollywood and these kinds of things, and I got on the highway there. And what a mess. You had these uh, very uh, fast movements of cars, and then all of a sudden a quick shutdown, and you just kind of hit your brake and drop down to zero or to five miles an hour, then for no apparent reason, off you go again at 80 miles an hour. Life on the, the fast lane in uh, LA. Um, it was very crowded. In fact, I, I recall that I was in Hollywood. I was eating at a uh, fast food restaurant that was just catty corner to the uh, theater where uh, the, the stars have their, their star, the, the movie stars have their stars in the pavement in front of the movie theater. I think it's a Chinese theater there. And I thought I would uh, get my car out of the uh, parking lot of the restaurant because they had a big sign saying you can't stay there, to, uh, you can't park there to tour, you had to only be there for the restaurant. So I got out of the car, turned right into traffic, and I wanted to just go across the street and find a place to park over there, near where the theater was, so I could see all these stars of the famous, Clark, Gable, and all the rest of them. So I get in my car, and I go to make a right turn, and the traffic was so heavy that I could only get into the right turn lane. And next thing I know, I had to take a, a right-hand turn away from the movie theater that was ahead of me. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just move over to the left lane and make a left-hand turn and, and make my way back. Well, <laughs> that didn't work out well. Traffic was so heavy and there was no room to move, I got funneled off onto a highway. Next thing I knew, I was going 60 miles an hour. Who knows where? Uh, that was L.A. But things have changed now because of this coronavirus, and people are uh, called upon by uh, at least some of the state uh, governors, I think California and New York, maybe uh, uh, some others as well. Uh, they're called to shelter in place. And so not all non-essential businesses are to be shut down, and people are to stay at home and wait until this virus makes its way through and leaves our country for good. Shelter in place. Where do you go when you face danger? Where is your place of refuge? For the psalmist, there is no question about where he would go. His uh, place of retreat, his place of safety was in the presence of God, the presence of His God. Now, if you look at this psalm that we have before us here, uh, let me first uh, give you a bit of an outline for how the psalm develops this theme of God as the refuge of His people. And uh, we'll see how the psalm is developed here, and, and then we'll make some points along the way. Uh, first, as those of you who followed me for some time now realize I, I believe that scriptures are organized in a covenantal arrangement. If you go to, uh, for example, the, what I call the sermons of Paul and his epistles, or the sermons of Peter and Acts, you go to uh, most any book of the Bible and begin to analyze it in the way that it is structured, I think you will find that it is uh, structured in a covenantal arrangement. Now, 
that gets into a lot of uh, theory that I don't have time here to address, but the five points, if you will, of covenantalism you might describe as, first of all, the introduction, which is uh, a revelation of the uh, transcendent God by His Word and, and presence. Uh, the glory of God is the beginning part of any uh, address from God. And so God is the one who speaks to us with authority, and we listen to Him, and we draw near to Him. And so uh, the, this psalm, uh, the first two verses, speaks about those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. And so the transcendence of God is certainly in view. God's majesty, His glory is presented before us. And we need to have this view of God in such a way that we may be suitably prepared in our hearts to receive what this God has to say to us and what is yet to come. Then you get into the, what uh, in English um, uh, composition classes will describe as the body of the uh, psalm, or uh, I'll describe as uh, points two, three, and four here. Uh, point two in a covenantal arrangement talks about the history of God's dealing with his people. What God has done for his people through uh, those who are appointed as officers in this church. And in particular, it talks about really what God has done for us in Christ, the great officer of the church, the prophet, priest, and king, and through his anointed representatives, uh, and through his church at large. And so, if we look at that, we consider verses 3 through 8 as descriptive of what God has done, or in this circumstance in the psalm, it is in the form of a future-looking psalm, and so it is in anticipation of what God will do for His people in delivering them from their earthly enemies. And so verse 3 talks about being delivered from the snare of the fowler, we'll talk about that, God's protection as a shield for His people, uh, protection from the arrows and pestilence, uh, and, and, and the destruction of the enemies around us. And so here you have a, a foretaste of what God will do for his people in defending them against their enemies, their earthly enemies. And then after a review of what, what God will do for his people, we then have the stipulation, the third point of the covenantal arrangement, uh, where God tells us what we are to do in response to what he's done for us in Christ. And so, because God in Christ delivers us from our enemies, therefore we should, and generally speaking, we should trust Him, believe in Him, obey Him. Those are the basic uh, exhortations that are made. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. And so, you have here in the ninth verse, uh, and, and really into the tenth verse as well, a little bit, but especially the ninth verse, you have this implied, it's not explicit, but it's implied exhortation, this implied demand. Uh, and so it reads in verse 9, because, <clears throat> because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. So really verse 9 is the center of the psalm, I would say, it's the third point of five, it's the center which the, the psalm revolves around. Everything leads up to this exhortation, this command, and works out of it as well. In particular, you can note how the psalm picks up the theme of the introduction, verses 1 and 2. The, this third point picks up the introduction, verses 1 and 2, about dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. Verse 9, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. It's really an echo of the first uh, verse or two of the psalm, which introduces us to the glory of God. Now, bear in mind the introduction prepares us for the themes that are yet to come in the, the, the text. And now here we have the, the, the point that God wants to make. In other words, that you should trust in the Lord. Make Him your dwelling place. This is the implied exhortation. We should examine ourselves and make sure that we are dwelling in the Lord. We've made Him our refuge. 
And so that's the center of the psalm. And you'll see that we come back to that theme uh, very specifically at the end of the psalm. If you look at, I believe, verses 14 through 16. Turn the page. Yes, verse 14. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name and so forth. And so here, that uh, sense of covenant familiarity, that sense of commitment, trust, faith, is once more sounded at the end of the psalm, the conclusion of the psalm. That is the fifth point of the text, the uh, fifth point of this covenant arrangement, where uh, the, the implied exhortation here to trust in the Lord is worked out and, and uh, broken down in practical ways, and here uh, the individual is prepared for going on from here. In view of what God uh, says to us, how He will protect us, and in view of the fact that we commit ourselves to Him, then as we look forward from here, as we go from this place, and in the fifth uh, part of the covenantal uh, structure, there are the succession arrangements, there are things which look to the future. Uh, who will be the next king? Uh, who will? Uh, what will be done with the, the, the treaty uh, in terms of it's being read again? In other words, people are prepared for the future. A good sermon will take the, the basic idea of the text, bring it home in a, a powerful, illustrative, perhaps emotional conclusion to prepare people to take one big nugget from the sermon with them as they go from there. That's what you have at the end of the psalm. And then uh, that's the first, third, and fifth points that uh, touch on the same thing. And the, the second, the history of redemption, and the fourth point, which is the, the benefits, the rewards, the blessings, or curses uh, uh, on those who obey or disobey, uh, come to us at, at the last, well, verse 10, really, to verse 13. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. Here's the benefit of trusting in the Lord. No evil will befall you. Uh, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Other hands will lift you up. And you'll tread over your enemies. The, the lion and the, uh, uh, the adder or the snake. Uh, so here you have uh, the blessing of fellowship with God and the, the ministry of God for his elect in a very special way. So in, in the second point, you have God contending with the enemies of the church on an earthly level. And then on the fourth uh, section, you have the, the blessings that come to God's people in a special way in the uh, ministry of the heavenlies for us. And so uh, God's protection for us from earthly enemies and God's provision for us of angelic powers to assist us in this life. So that we might know the joy of blessing and, and dwelling in the presence of God. This is a, a, a very rich and profound psalm it seems to be in the way that it's structured and the way that it calls us to faith in our covenant keeping God. Now, uh, let's uh, begin to look at these different points that, uh, as we're able to in succession here. Uh, at, at beginning there, first verses 1 and 2, we have a view of our God and His work in protecting His church. And so we see first some of the descriptions of God. He is the Most High, uh, verse 1. He's also the Almighty. Verse 2, He's the Lord. My refuge, my fortress, my God. And so we have these various descriptions of who God is. And as I was reading the psalm, I was thinking to myself, what would the liberal critic say with regard to this text? And uh, I, it didn't take me long to figure that out. Indeed, I, as I did some reading, I, I found support for that from the liberal side of things. When it talks about the Most High, uh, it, it's the script of, of uh, El Elyon, God Most High. And you might recall that uh, when Melchizedek met Abram uh, after his battle with uh, the, I think it was the four kings of the north against the five kings to the south and so forth and all that, Melchizedek meets him and blesses Abraham 
Abram in the name of God Most High, El Elyon. Now Melchizedek was from Jerusalem. He was the high priest of God Most High there in Jerusalem, which was the city, the Jebusite city at the time. And liberal critics, when they come to both that text of Genesis 14 and this text as well, describe this God, El, and El Yon, as Canaanite gods, or singular God, or plural gods. And so, uh, on one hand, uh, there is an anticipation among secular uh, commentators that you have here an indication of uh, the original polytheism out of which the Abrahamic monotheistic faith uh, developed. And they will say that uh, perhaps originally among the Canaanites, the god El and the god El Yon, the god, his name is God, and then El Yon, the most high, um, uh, those two gods are fused into one to become El El Yon, God most high. And so that's the idea that some would have. And then when you think of the most high God, that suggests that there are gods that are not quite so high. Other gods that are in the pantheon of gods, and so we're talking about the one who's the most high in, in the context of many gods. And so you see how uh, liberalism, uh, skepticism comes to Scripture and really eats away at the faith of God's people in the revelation of God. It's very clear that Melchizedek uh, was a priest of the true God, Abraham uh, gave him a tithe of his uh, 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 prophet, his reward, and, uh, and, and Melchizedek becomes in Scripture a type of Christ. Now that gets into a whole other uh, development. You can see one of our recent sermons in Genesis on that. But uh, the, the notion that Melchizedek was a servant of a, a Canaanite deity not connected to the God who has revealed himself to Abram is, I think, most unsatisfactory, if I can put it that way. Uh, the sense that Abram, who is worshiping a true God, will then turn to this Canaanite deity and his priest and offer him a tithe, isn't that not to betray the God who revealed himself to Abram? That would be idolatry on Abram's part, it would be forsaking his covenant God. And so Melchizedek was not representing uh, multiple gods, the Canaanite deities, or, or one particular God was high among many, but he's representing the true God, the same God that Abram worshipped, the only God. We should not be surprised that there were others in the world who confess faith in the true God beyond just Abraham. Yes, Abraham was the one through whom the promises would be made. Abraham was the one through whom the Christ would come. But God still had others in the world who presumably had faith in the true God, who had the fear of the Lord in their hearts. Remember the period of time from Adam to Noah, there were quite a few people who call upon the name of the Lord, and it is reasonable to assume that after Noah, there would be uh, some, at least, in humanity who continue to call upon the name of the Lord. The God of Noah, the God of Abel, Seth, and Adam as well. And so, uh, and, and incidentally, the book of Job, the, the, the individual Job, likely lived about the time of Abraham as well. Uh, somewhere about that time frame. So uh, the, the notion that El Elyon refers to a polytheistic situation is entirely contrary to the interests of Scripture, which constantly point us to the uniqueness of the God who revealed himself to Abraham. And so this much to say about the nature of the God who reveals himself, he is the most high, which means that he is one who is exalted over all. He is above all the creation. Everything is subject to him. He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. No matter what principalities and powers and other things might be at work in the world today, 
God is God most high. That speaks of his great authority. Uh, he speaks and all must obey his will for he is the most high. He is also the almighty. Uh, the Hebrew word here is Shaddai or El Shaddai. Uh, God Almighty. We saw that God revealed himself in those same terms to Abraham long ago. This, I think, tends to move us in the direction of thinking that Moses might have been the author of this psalm in that he uses the same language for God in Abraham's experience. Um, we saw God reveal himself to Abraham as God most, of course, as the Almighty in Genesis 17. Uh, so, I think there might be some possibilities there to consider. In any case, uh, God is the Almighty. He uh, is the one who accomplishes His will in the earth. Now, this uh, omnipotent God, this all-powerful God, is not one whose power is free to go and do whatever He pleases, uh, no matter what the consequences are. His power is... Uh, that which puts into effect his truth, his righteousness, his love, his mercy, uh, his will, everything is effectuated by the power of God. And so we may not understand God Almighty in separation from the God who is righteous and just and good and merciful and kind and gracious. And so God is powerful in His grace, as He is powerful in His justice as well. And in all these things, He is one God. So, He is the Almighty. Now, the first three verses speak, two verses speak of dwelling in the shelter of the Most High and the shadow of the Almighty. God is a refuge and a fortress. And you have all these images then of what it means to dwell in God. Uh, a, a refuge, a fortress, um, uh, taking uh, or, or abiding in the shadow of God. Uh, if you look at commentaries again, they have different ways of trying to describe this. Sigmund Bowinkel, a, a very well-known, I think, German uh, theologian who writes a massive book on the Psalms, uh, sees everything very much in the Psalms related to what you might describe as a cult or the religious life of the Jews there in Jerusalem. And uh, so the, the idea that uh, the psalm speaks of taking refuge in God and, and uh, finding in Him your, your shelter is an, an oblique, if you will, um, uh, a description of the temple worship in Jerusalem. Uh, we take refuge in God as He reveals Himself in the temple. And I think there may be a fair bit of truth to that. The, the temple is a place where uh, reconciliation under the old covenant shadows and types was made. It is there that we find peace with God in that old covenant context where our sins are dealt with through the sacrifices of the animals, anticipating the sacrifice of Christ yet to come. And so under that idea, uh, the temple is a place where we find shelter with God. It is the presence of God, His uh, union with His people, as manifested at that temple, which comes into view here. I think there's much to that. Uh, I think as well that perhaps at the center of this is the covenant relationship that God has with His people. You recall how the temple is uh, structured. You, you've got the, the, the bronze altar outside, and then the pillars, and then you come inside the temple or tabernacle. You come into the holy place, and there's the, the table with the showbread, there's the lampstand, and then uh, a, 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 a place for incense. And then you have the most holy place, uh, the, a great curtain dividing the two. And in the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant. And over the Ark of the Covenant are the cherubim with the wings stretched out to cover the the uh, uh, the seat of the the, the ark, the, the uh, cover, the, the atoning cover there, and so their wings are were spread that, across that ark uh, from, with two uh, cherubim, and they're both looking 
looking down at the ark. Now, the ark is, if you will, the throne of God, where God dwells among his people, and it is the place where the covenant is kept. That agreement, if you will, that God makes with his people to be their God. Uh, and so at the heart of the temple worship, at the heart of the sacrifices, is the word of God, the covenant of God, the promises that God makes to us. If you wish to find uh, refuge and a place of safety in this world, the only place to find it is here, in a covenant relationship with God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the most high God who is almighty. The one who is worthy of your trust because he has covenanted himself to be your God. And he's made a way for reconciliation to take place so that your sins might be dealt with. And that you might be welcomed into his presence and received with joy and thanksgiving. Of course, the new covenant fulfillment of this is in Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, where the atonement is made for us and we are reconciled to God. And then as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, that Jew and Gentile, as one, one man, one body, uh, have, an act, have equal access in the presence of the Father through the Spirit. And so the Spirit who unites us to Christ then brings us into the presence of our Heavenly Father. And we dwell in His heavenly temple, the city of God, the house of God. And we are being built up into this house, a living temple where God himself dwells. And so the, the psalm uh, brings us into view of the glory and majesty of God. God in his temple. God who has come in himself to be our God and therefore has provided us with reconciliation. This is the God with whom we meet at the beginning of the psalm, and this is the God who gives to us his sure and certain promises for protection as we go on through the psalm. Now I'm sensing that this is taking a little while to work through, so unfortunately I'm going to move a little bit more quickly uh, through the rest of the psalm. But I want to cover a couple of things that I think are of most interest to you as we think about this coronavirus that's going around and the implications of that for the church. Because when you get to verse 3 through 8, you see there's a promise that God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. There's that word, pestilence, at the end of verse 3. And then you'll find it again uh, in verse 6. The pestilence that stalks in darkness. There's kind of a, a if you will, enveloping there of uh, uh, this portion of, of the, the psalm here, where uh, themes that begin uh, come back towards the end and probably towards the center is something that uh, gets us uh, focused, uh, and that is uh, under his wings, I think you will find refuge, his faithfulness, and the shield and buckler. And so that is at the center, verse 3 through uh, 8. And uh, it's where we may take great confidence and hope. But this idea of pestilence is something that we are very much concerned about. Does God protect his people from pestilence? Well, I think that we can say, generally speaking, that uh, the blessings of God upon a Christian culture are such that that culture, as they live in the light of God's word, as they put into practice the principles of the word of God, God will bless that country with and advance in such a way that it will have various sorts of medicines and, and uh, applications and therapies that would be beneficial to protect us people from many things. And of course today we have various kinds of vaccines and medications that protect us from all kinds of things. Uh, you, you really don't have in the United States cases of malaria, of leprosy, uh, and many other things because we have vaccines to protect us from these and many, many other diseases. And so God has blessed the church and the community in which the church lives with these kinds of things that help to protect us from harm. I would note, incidentally, that uh, this virus, this coronavirus, which has spread across the world, has its origins in a 
pagan nation, China, the communist nation, China, in Wuhan, China, uh, and uh, especially at a point in time where China has been afflicting the Christian church. China has been imprisoning Christian pastors. China has been oppressing Christian people, breaking up their churches, changing their hymns, calling them basically to the worship of the state. It's there that this plague originated. But it had implications for the rest of the world. But you see how a pagan nation, which does not live in the light of the word of God, but lives in the light of its own humanistic uh, point of view, it is a place where plagues may break out and bring all kinds of harm to people. And so we have here a discussion on these kinds of things. You'll note though at verse 3 it says that God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. And uh, the idea of the fowler, uh, or the one who uh, captures fowl, birds, uh, he sets up a snare to try to catch the bird, and the image there is of the church as being perhaps uh, a, a, a bunch of uh, baby birds that are walking about and happen to uh, fall into this trap or another bird that gets caught. Uh, the image here is of the work of Satan himself. Satan himself is one who uh, works to uh, deceive the people of God like a trap would do to lure them in and then capture them and destroy them. That's his work. Uh, he is the adversary. He is the Satan. Uh, the one who uh, is the enemy of the church. And so uh, I think that the text here, while it does suggest that there will be blessing upon the Christian nation that, uh, and the people that um, uh, follow the word of God, uh, at the same time, it's not, I think, meant to suggest uh, entirely that we will be free from the kinds of things that the rest of the world endures. Remember the book of Ecclesiastes that sees everything under the sun. Makes the note that both the righteous and the wicked die. And it's true. Even if you're uh, a good man and live a good life, you still may die. You still will die. And you may die an early death as well. Death comes to all. And that death may come in a variety of means, including plagues and viruses and uh, bacterial agents and so forth. So there are many different ways in which this kind of thing can happen. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the, the text is speaking of the satanic temptation, and we need to be very careful that we do not fall into satanic temptation from the world of the flesh or the devil they are seeking to destroy us. Uh, God's promise is that he will protect us from these kinds of things and bring us safely through them all. Now, I'm seeing that my cameras are about to uh, finish up as they are only working by battery, so I think I will finish the sermon here, unfortunately, and we'll uh, pick it up again at a future time. And uh, maybe that will be a second part of the sermon that I can do later on. Uh, at this point, God bless. We look forward to seeing you as soon as possible. Take care. Bye.